Today, we're gonna to take a look at the executive perspective of the market and get some insights from an established leader. So stay tuned. Hey everybody, this is Chris Brandt here without Sundish Patel today. Welcome to another future podcast. The best way you can help this channel is by subscribing. So clicking that button is greatly appreciated. Today we're talking with Suja Chandra. She has held executive technology positions in a range of companies, including Fortune number no. one Walmart, where she was global chief technology and digital officer. She has had prominent roles at a wide range of companies like Kimberly Clark, Nestle, and Timberland. She has specialized in M&A. She's a frequent industry speaker and investor. Suja sits on the board of several public companies like American Eagle Outfitters, Cardinal Health, as well as private companies like Bloom Global Technologies and Agendia. Additionally, she founded T200, an organization devoted to advancing women in technology. Most recently, she served as Senior EVP and Chief Digital and Information Officer at Common Spirit Health. So Suja is here to tell us about what she's seeing in the market and how technology is impacting business during these disruptive times. Welcome, Suja. Thank you. Before we get into all the details of what's going on in this just absolutely crazy market, um, tell me a little bit about your story. You know, you've had quite a quite a career, and you know, I would love to hear you know the progression of how you got into this. Thank you said, Chris, I'm a business operator, technology leader, and um, certainly my journey is a global journey. I was born and raised in India, and I uh, I lived in Australia, where I also did my masters, and then I came to the United States. I've lived and worked in uh, Europe and Latin America, so it's a very geographically distributed. It's a very geographically diverse in terms of people uh, that I've worked with, and I embrace that. It has given me the opportunity, my, my career journey has given me the opportunity to run some amazing transformations. I led end-to-end uh, -end business process transformation at Nestle, which is the world's largest consumer goods, food and beverage company. And uh, it, it, the, my journey has given me the opportunity to also lead retail transformations in the 80s of omni-channel disruptions, customer centricity, data and tech-enabled business model creations. And I've done that in smaller companies, such as the Timberland Company or, or the Fortune One, as in Walmart. Yeah. And most recently, I've been at Common Spirit Health and, uh, and led that from a provider healthcare context and uh, leading digital health with Common Spirit. So it's, it's an interesting journey. I will tell you, I'm, I'm certainly thrilled about the business results. But I am equally thrilled about the people that I've had the opportunity to work with. And it's it's just each one of those people interactions, the people and the amazing togetherness we've had, uh, that is very dear to my heart. Your your journey's kind of really interesting because you've you've got a lot of different types of industry in there. You know, you've got everything. I mean, obviously, you know, we don't get to an opportunity to say fortune number one too often, but, you know, you've got the Walmart in there, which is, you know, just an, a massive, uh, just both online, uh, you know, endeavor. It's a massive logistics, you know, thing. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's the biggest employer in, in, you know, many, many states, right? But then you've got, you know, Nestle. So you're in, in the food products and consumer goods with Timberland. And now you're into healthcare. So you're kind of touching everything from B to B to B to C and everything in between, right? I mean, that's got to give you some really interesting perspective. Certainly, I look at it as very consumer centered. So every industry I've been part of, irrespective of which company, but there's a fair, there's a clear focus around consumer on the customer. Mm -hmm. There's a clear focus around business and business metrics and value creation. There is a clear focus around people. So while the companies have varied, some of the themes have been very common and de and definitely leading technology and operations in these companies has been a Absolutely fulfilling. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So, um, you know, like I mentioned, we're kind of in these incredibly disruptive times, right? I mean, COVID um, really changed the game, right? I mean, there was a lot of, you know, huge disruption. Um, and now you're you're kind of in the in the digital health realm. I mean, you know, like you're kind of in the firing line of everything that's happening here, right, in the industry. Um, could you give me a little bit of, like, what your perspective is on on how you know digital health has been changing and you know what you've been seeing in that space look at some of the numbers 
things that you wouldn't have thought of normally. So wearables, which is one of the elements, so I'm sure you're wearing a couple of wearables on you. And the wearables industry is growing at at least 20% uh, compound annual growth rate to 2026. Therapeutics, uh, I mean, you probably are using a couple of therapeutics in your life, digital therapeutics, are growing at a late rate of 31% leading up to 2030. Virtual visits, which was practically decimal dust pre-COVID, is growing at a, at a rate of 14%, depending on who you who you believe in or which how you count it. It's anywhere between 14 and 37%, leading up to almost an 800 billion industry of its own by 2028. Mm-hmm. And, and the investment, the venture investments, the venture investments topped $38 billion in 2021, which is a 75% growth over 2020. Yeah. So the numbers are here, the significant focus around value-based care, going from fee-for-service, so you pay for a visit, to much more of a whole body focus. So the value-based care is a key trend. That is definitely a key trend around uh, the patient taking care of themselves, uh, so there is a focus on consumerization, so taking care of where the consumer is rather than just getting them. And, and a focus on uh, instead of just this episodic health-based events, discrete episodic events, to much more of a, a continuum of care. Mm-hmm. So all of those are there. So we focused on four major, uh, four major themes, right? So we focused around patient experiences, so which is really, uh, you, I'm sure you have your doctor's visit, mm-hmm. your journey, how you engage with your provider, uh, your experiences as a part of that front door, whether it's a digital front door or a physical facility that you walk into, your your own information, your access to your own information, uh, your referrals, your secondary your secondary referral, your tertiary referral, referrals from your provider. So all of that is digital patient experiences. And then we focused on virtual care, we which was a huge story at the heydays of the COVID. We went to almost ninety percent of our are of our clinical visits were on virtual modalities, uh, it came down, but we also scaled up virtual as a capability, not just in a clinical context, but we scaled it out in inside our hospitals. We, we scaled it in our health at home capabilities. And, and when we look at that virtual and, and, and as a key modality, that is a big push and our big focus in our digital health. Therapeutics, being able to partner with various therapeutics providers, Lavongo, Propeller Health, uh, TIA Health, so various therapeutics capabilities and, and making that as an integrated offering that our providers are comfortable sharing that with our with our patients. That is a major focus. And of course, focusing on our care providers. I'm sure you've seen it, you've heard about it. The human capital world in healthcare is going through a massive burnout. Yeah. There aren't enough people to begin with, and it's a massive burnout. So focusing on our care providers, giving them the simplest ways in which they can do their work instead of the burden of having to do all the work. So that has been a major focus. So, and I can, I will land this for you with some very specific stories. Sure. This is the beauty of being in healthcare. It is the purpose of healthcare is just heart. Uh, it just warms your heart. And it's just, it's just so purposeful. Yeah. We have, we have seen and heard stories where an ER room, there's a patient, there's an escalation or a patient, a near death, but there is a virtual nurse watching the patient. So she immediately steps in and there is a call and the, and the provider comes running and the patient is rescued. I mean, that is, that is gut right shame. Mm-hmm. Being able to predict sepsis. A patient gets checked into the hospital, but to be able to predict sepsis based on various factors, based on age, conditions, various factors, being able to predict to what degree this patient could have a, a sepsis escalation and then the provider is able to provide the right intervention. Those are heart rendering in terms of playing in digital heart. That sounds really interesting. I I, I think, you know, like I, I you know, patient experience is, is, is an interesting one, but, but the one thing you mentioned there, the sort of that virtual care, I think is a really interesting piece of it, right? Because that's kind of a newer thing, right? And I know, you know, back in the day before all the pandemic and everybody went virtual, there was a lot of like remote, like radiography and things like that, where the, that was like kind of like, we, you know, we don't, and, 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 and in dressing, you know, exactly what you said with sort of labor, a tight labor market around this being really difficult, the ability to sort of source, you know, radiologists across the country to sort of analyze things um, was really beneficial. Now we, you know, now we've gotten to a place where it's like, you know, 100x that, you know, you, you mentioned like a remote 
um, nurse. And it reminds me of a story I just read this morning about uh, Taika Waititi in the latest Thor movie. He remotely directed the end credits scene. So it's like, I mean, it's not just, it's just like all these industries are sort of, you know, like getting comfortable with sort of remotely operating things. But I, I think, you know, like that remote nursing piece is a really interesting thing. And I got to imagine there's a lot of um, other really interesting sort of telehealth kind of things. I know our doctors now are offering the option of like, you can come in if I don't actually have to, you know, lay hands on you, we can just do a telehealth thing. And it's extremely convenient. And uh, I mean, so there's like, there's, it's, um, it's an interesting time because the way you, what you mentioned with, you know, just incredible growth in so many of these sectors here, um, just the expansion of that market, but also the expansion of the modalities in which you can, you know, service people is really interesting. And it's all, you know, centered around technology, right? I wouldn't say, right? I would say it's all centered around the human. Right. Healthcare okay. in general has focused around the patient. So you would say any any provider or anybody would say it's a patient-centered industry. Sure, sure. I really think the workflows, the data, all of that being refocused around that patient and that the consumerization and the humans in general, right? Not just the patient, but the provider, the nurse, the radiologist, the technician, right. the person who is going to take care of the environment. So the human-centered capabilities are fundamental to digital health. I see technology, data, AI, and all kinds of technologies, right? Remote patient monitoring, you talked about virtual health, uh, remote patient monitoring from a health at home context. Uh, that is a major play, right? All of the technologies are enablers in this big movement that's happening. You're right. It, it, it's a, it's, a, it's a patient-centric, but technology-enabled, perhaps, is what I should that's have said. Right. That's it. Yeah. Technology, you could say technology accelerated as well. So technology certainly accelerates these capabilities and the availability and being experienced totally differently. Um, I find when my physician has online scheduling, it is so much more easier to get on her calendar. Yeah. I'm waiting on the phone for her. And then this is the case. This is industry's proven uh, metrics is that people who have to wait for a phone appointment and it's usually the average wait time is 30 minutes. Yeah. And, the, and the call drops and they never get that schedule. They just postpone the visit. So simple things, online scheduling technologically, it is not rocket science. No. But to be able to offer that, it is, it is a change. Providers are not used to offering schedules online. So it is a change management from a human perspective. Technologically, it is not that complex. But once you put that in, you truly turn that into a patient-centered event. You also mentioned like the digital therapeutics, and and I know like one of the big things for you, uh, you centers around a lot of work you've been doing around like artificial intelligence and things like that. I mean, could you speak to how like the industry has changed around that and the, some of the kinds of things that you're introducing uh, into the to the process that's you know really enhancing that piece? So artificial intelligence certainly has reached a point, a tipping point, where it has gone from this single use cases and in the enterprise that is always this, oh, we've got this AI use case and like 10 people are using it, right? That's, got, that's moving to much more of scaled, institutionalized, robust capabilities. Consumer mm -hmm. world, we all use. We all use AI products every day. Our GPS is sure. basically an AI product. So we, and so the enterprise has certainly gone and it's, it's matriculated into that direction. In healthcare, we'll talk about a few things. Healthcare has always been evidence driven Evidence-driven means there's a ton of data behind it. Amplify that with all the data that is streaming from your wearables. And the physicians right. are beginning to use it and accept your, your wearable-based metric as a part of your virtual consultation. Then you add on top of that the interoperability and the regulatory moment in between interoperability where providers exchange information with other providers, where, where the patient goes, the data flows. Um, so across all of that, there is a massive momentum and massive push happening. All of this is also generating a ton more data in general, not just in healthcare, but in general, the industry metrics are we generate 2.5 billion gigabytes of data per day. Wow. That's 2.5 million terabytes of data per day. And we're going to go grow that 5x in the next three years. So all of this means that there has to be AI or, or AI is the umbrella term with machine learning as a major subset in natural language processing. There's so many subcomponents of AI, irrespective of what you apply, AI has become a, a mainstream. 
And in, uh, in digital health, I will give you a few things that I have personally been part of and what we have done. I'm on the board of Agendia. We focus on uh, women's health with breast cancer. We apply molecular diagnostics to and, and genomic, genomic mapping to be able to predict certain things about the breast cancer, the nature, the kind of treatment, and the, and the, and the prospects of that. Now, we are taking that, which is a very wet lab kind of a diagnostic, towards a digital diagnostic. So using the images and being able to map that to patterns, having studied the history of multiples of data sets that we have, to be able to make a digital product available. So the same thing can be done where it takes seven days. Now, it only takes the time for the, the front point of the core biopsy to be able to get that into the slide. And then the actual algorithm runs very quickly that afternoon. That shortens the time, which is a massive. I'm sure your your sisters, your child, your your mother, or anybody in your family may have had. And that wait time is extremely difficult for the patient when you're waiting for a result to come. So that speed reduction is happening, and that's a digital enabled AI product. So then let's talk about other things. Being able to offer predictive uh, predictive algorithms and results for readmissions. One of the things we work on is to, when a patient comes in, we want to be able to take care of them. When they, go, when they get discharged, they go home. That is an environment to take care of them at home. We want them to be healthy at home, so we don't want a readmission. To project and, and to be able to model and predict the readmission, and then depending on the prediction, we can already start making interventions at the point of discharge at, at home. That prevents a readmission and therefore it reduces the cost, it improves patient experience, ultimately it's better health. So that is a, is a key element and it's a, it's a data AI-based uh, capability. So we can keep going on and on. Revenue cycle, so the payer-provider interrelationship is very complex. So you've got the major government payers, Medicare and Medicaid, you've got commercial payers, you've got direct employer and self-payments. There's all these varieties of payments administered over millions of contracts with the various kinds of providers and coding, millions of different types of coding. Every visit that you have, every kind of treatment as a code, and if it is not coded appropriately, the payment is not going to happen. That whole thing is a data algorithmic problem, all the way from was it coded appropriately, was it built appropriately, was it paid appropriately? And not just that, but also the follow-on activity. It wasn't just that, once again, that episode. The value-based care means that if you had this and this was coded this way, then did these subsequent codes follow by these additional mm-hmm. treatments you were supposed to have prescribed for these diagnostics? Did you actually do the diagnostics? Did the result come? Was there a code for that? So it's, it is also patient-centered. So that's an AI and digital product. So I will tell you, in 10 years, all the ologies, cardiology, radiology, pathology, all the ologies will have some form of AI-infused uh, capability. I don't believe the human there will ever be entirely replaced, but there will be a, a, a significant play by AI, which will improve accuracy, it will improve speed, it will improve productivity for the person, it will improve, uh, improve patient, patient care and patient experience and cost ultimately. But I will also tell you what has excited me recently in general is the whole generative AI. Have you played with uh, Dali? Have you gone in I and played with Dali? I was playing around with... Uh, stable uh, diffusion table. So I was playing with that and I generated nice images and playing with that. It's, it's just phenomenal and the possibilities. Generative yeah. art is one, but then yeah. it's beyond generative art. It is about generative molecules. It's about generating engineering and design. So AI and the possibilities of AI, and, and you, I'm sure you've read Homo sapiens from Yuval Noah Harari, and his latest book talks about we're moving from humanism to a data center world. And I don't know whether it is it's entirely a black and white either or, but the data world is already here. We are surrounded by data and every element of our interaction is recorded as data and somewhere somebody is uh, analyzing it with an AI model. So I'm thrilled and excited about uh, artificial intelligence. I think you bring up some interesting points here. I mean, like, you know, obviously there's uh, this sort of when you're generating that amount of data, you know, which is a substantial amount of data, you know, like having people look at that and analyze it is is going to be impossible. There's just not enough people to do that and and do it fast enough to to make it worthwhile. Um, but you're also, you know, you're also bringing into it, you know, just the diagnostic piece of it, right? And just having, you know, uh, artificial intelligence look at things and make 
you know, preliminary determinations before it even gets to the specialist who can make that sort of final determination about care and, and, and diagnosis. Um, but you know, like the other piece of that then is when you talk about sort of this generative piece is, is, is that there's going to be new insights that are going to be coming out all the time because, you know, artificial is going to, artificial intelligence is going to come to different conclusions and different, have different insights than people would never necessarily have, you know, one, because we don't have as much data as an artificial intelligence system might, might have access to, but, you know, just the, the ability for it to kind of pursue novel things that humans perhaps wouldn't even think to find. Absolutely. Not just healthcare, right? So even if, let's say, you're, up, you're browsing a website, the website being able to use generative AI to create an image based on your browsing pattern. So that's where sort of, and, and also the generative AI has a big place to play in the emerging world of the metaverse and the web 3.0, right? So certainly I see the possibilities in molecules and drug, dis drug discovery and the match possibility between molecules and, uh, and, and clinical pathways of various diseases and conditions. I think the other thing when you start, you know, talking about the, the Web three and things like that, there are things in healthcare that are really particularly well suited for, you know, some of, of you know these distributed ledger systems, you know, like just sort of the provenance of medications and you know just from you know creation to you know distribution, you know, tracking, you know, that. So if there's any problems, they can be quickly identified, you know, all the way to, you know, different um, aspects of patient security and, and privacy and, and all that. I got to imagine that's a big piece for you too, huh? You know, Web 3.0, because it started from the gaming industry, or certainly there is a perspective that it's gaming is already there. Think of the gamer playing with an avatar, collaboratively playing with other players' avatars, in our technology environment with the VR headset, buying NFT apparel that he or she transports from one gaming site to another gaming site and an ad that is popping up in that virtual world that is placed appropriately, that world is today. That's already happening today. And he or she is also paying, paying with, uh, with some kind of a crypto or digital currency for the game and collecting with crypto or digital currency. So that game is already there, but expand that world a lot more into the enterprise, into the into the big business use cases, and uh, and and that is beginning to happen. And I look at it in maybe three, four different components, Chris. I look at it as certainly the content, the content creation. It'll that'll take off in its own way, in its own big way. That is the platforms, which are the platforms in which they will be distributed. Which today's platforms are are inadequate, suboptimal, and they will mature for so the whole platform maturation. The infrastructure, the devices, uh, I mean, we've all talked about the VR device not being adequate, or even in general, other devices, VR on mobile. Uh, and, and, and then the enablement, payments and a lot more simple capabilities and cybersecurity, cybersecurity and privacy in the space. The DAO or the distributed autonomous uh, abilities to govern and self-management, self-governance will be another capability that all of these sort of maybe a step zero, step 0.5, step one of a multi-step journey. And we're going to see this gather momentum in a in a big way. Now, blockchain is interesting. I've, uh, I've, uh, I've in my own mind, I've, I've uh, worked with blockchain, but also have thought about possibilities that the same thing is possible with APIs and other capabilities. So why blockchain with all the complexities? But, but the more I work on it and the more I reflect on it in a multi-party situation like a supply chain, which is not just a one-on-one, -on -one. it just, just, just doesn't happen between one point to one point. That is so many players upstream and downstream, certainly the smart contracts could play a role there. On the recent shift that you saw with Ethereum going from proof of work to proof of stake and the whole environmental improvement that comes along with it, that is a huge yeah. change. So I'm warming up in a big way towards the blockchain as well. So um, I think the value use cases are beginning to come. And with the value, money investment will follow, and it's going to it's going to explode dramatically, especially in the spaces of enterprise collaborations and being able to have these conversations in the metaverse. Uh, those will explode. Those is a those is basic way to complete training and education going into the metaverse. That's happening, um, and, and I also see it's not just physical and digital. There's probably a lot more 
things granular within the physical world. So the interface and integration interoperability between the mechanical world and the digital world, the hydraulic world and the digital world, the, the human world and the digital world, a lot more granularity, a lot more detailed, a lot more frictionless. When you really think about that deeper and think of value creation, I think those would be the use cases that will drive uh, results. Early uh, implementations of blockchain and you know NFTs have sort of been um, less exciting, I think. Less exciting, but, but I think there's underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> underwhelming, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you know, but I think it a lot of the you know just the train wreck that has been some of the implementations has overshadowed some of the you know what what could be potentially very positive use cases um, that are much more well suited for this. Um, although I guess, you know, cybercrime is, is a great use case for it too, <laughs> but, but I think there's definitely, you know, like you mentioned there, you know, the, you know, the smart contracts and things like that could really play, play an interesting role in this. And, and, and speaking to that, I mean, you know, there's another side to this and there's another big, you know, thing that's been in, in, uh, discussion a lot around sort of supply chain issues. And I know that, is a huge issue in the healthcare space. And I know you do a lot to try to manage <laughs> manage all those supply chain challenges. Do you realize we spend something like 9 to 10% of the US GDP um, just on supply chain and logistics in the US? That is roughly about $1.8 to $1.9 trillion. It is such a complex thing all the way from manufacturing, design manufacturing, shipping and all the different forms of shipping, uh, logistics and uh, it is warehousing, certainly, but the transportation part of logistics is not just as one thing. It is ocean, it's air, it's rail, it's dray, it is on the road, it is middle, it is the front first, first miles, middle miles, last miles. It is everything in between. It is so complex with so many different players. And um, I'll tell you, just the, just the complexity is, is difficult to grasp. And uh, many companies are shackled by very archaic systems and technologies, and they're sort of being, uh, not, that, not that they don't want to change it, but certainly today, that shackling of that data technology is real. But when you, when you look at players like Amazon, which is now almost at the level of market share, it's between FedEx and UPS in terms of market share, and as one of the largest logistics providers with the whole plethora of capabilities that they offer and other such platform, yeah. companies are beginning to form. And uh, yeah, there was an announcement you see in the public material on American Eagle Outfitters, which also is one of my board companies on the quite platforms. But then soon thereafter, the Gap made an announcement and Zara made an announcement. So there is a need for those kinds of conglomerate partnerships and technology and data enabled capabilities that are beginning to happen. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about three major disruptions that need to happen. The first is this asymmetry between electrons and atoms. So what do I mean by that? <laughs> uh, data flows faster than products, than atoms, right? But turn sure. the asymmetry into an advantage. So when data flows faster, you model and you plan and you predict. And, and based on those predictions, you make interven intervention actions. So that is a, there's a fire in the Bangladesh factory, which is a proverbial fire in the factory. So what do, what do we need to do? And, uh, and and that is not happening. It's easier said, but when you really look at the silos of the supply chain flow, it doesn't happen. So number one, that has to happen. And that is across the various vectors and various elements that are contained. That also has an ESG play. There's a major ESG play. The second, as a result of all of that, is the pooling of the assets. You can, there are so many empty trucks, half empty trucks, almost empty trucks that are going complying and and the pooling of the uh, supply chain assets that is enabled because of coupling it with the data, that will also create such synergies and reduce cost ultimately and ultimately improve other things. And the partnerships that result, even horizontal partnerships, vertical partnerships, all kinds of partnerships that happen, and, and all of those are technology and data underpinnings to them. So those major changes were beginning to begin to happen. And there's a maniacal, obsessive focus on efficiency-driven supply chains towards much more of a resilience, driven supply chains, pooling and collaboration supply chains. But a balanced scorecard that also is that it is a less impact on the environment that we took, put, took that container to better use, that truck to a better use, 
and ultimately also gave a bit of experience to the customer. So it's, it's not that all of these are done, but the customer didn't feel it, but really start with the customer experience first and that they got the best experience for the product, but also we didn't hurt the planet in the process and we pulled the resources and that it wasn't as, it is a big portion of your p and I mean, that's just a crazy amount. And, and you know, I think um, you, you bring up an, a sort of interesting point about the, the kind of shifting market there. I, you know, I, for so many years, just in time production, just in time production. That was the, that was sort of the mantra that everybody had. And then, you know, come the pandemic and you know some trade wars and tariffs, and all of a sudden, just in time production just completely falls apart. And you know, we're looking at some of those companies that you know, like, were the darlings of that you know movement. Now are looking at you know delivering product a year out because they're they're struggling with things um, and and, and th- this concept of building a supply chain for resilience and um, you know positive uh, environmental aspects is uh, a really probably both uh, welcome and positive uh, development. I would have I would say, huh? That's definitely a push. That's certainly one of the variables that's being concerned. It's not just a matter of shipping a lot of stuff. It's 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 where it goes and how much of it goes where. Um, can you talk a little bit about how like how that's sort of transforming in the industry? The modality, multi-modality, multi-channel, multi-points of engagement with the customers, physical and digital. And is, that is happening. That's a customer-centered drive. But where do you position your inventory as a part of that? And we had to make, businesses had to make very predetermined decisions on, I need to allocate X amount of inventory into each of these locations. But then you think of what COVID did to us. There was a day in which all stores, all retail stores, non-essential were shut down, and they couldn't open for at least a couple of months until after that. But then how do you serve customers? So they managed, being able to manage inventory fluidly, irrespective of which location, and taking inventory closer to the customer so you're able to service them in a much shorter duration, that takes business model thinking. So you, this is where supply chain has gone from sort of a back office function to much more of a customer-centered, crucial subcomponent of the overall business strategy and being able to do that. And then, the, of course, there's a fair amount of technology and data, route optimization, planning, prediction. It starts from the long-range planning and then the midterm lean season planning, the day day by day, week by week planning. So all of that are technology data driven. The companies that have done well are still not seeing the enormous amount of supply chain costs that other companies are seeing. Those companies that are not focused on this, they, they have reported enormous inflationary challenges in their supply chain. And I think the thing that's interesting about like the industry you're in, I mean, if like a network router doesn't arrive in time, it's kind of a bad day. But I mean, with some of the stuff that you're dealing with, it could literally be life or death. So, you know, like really managing your supply chain is super critical for you, I would imagine. Totally. Totally. One of your big passions is, you know, T200 and, 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 you know, elevating women in tech, you know, but, you know, how do you see this sort of talent transformation happening? You know, like, how, you know, you, you've got an eye on the view of sort of the labor market as well and how that's all working. The shape of work is changing. So is workplace, workforce, workscape. So all of that are going through this interesting shift. We went, we talked about the, the, the resignations, the shift, um, and then the white quitting, the white firing. That is just such a this change that's happening that is Almost some companies declaring 100% work from work. Some companies offering much more of hybrid capabilities, which is better. The debates are just still pretty hot. But I, I tell you, it's still, I worry, I, I was reflecting on why is it that we're all still very burnt out? To, sitting here in September 19th, 2022 is much better than September 2020. You will agree with that. For but sure. still, yeah. the burnout hasn't gone away. So there is something yeah. that is happening. Something else that's happening is it just the mental toll the macro situations are taking on people. There is something else that's happening. I, I'm not trying to solve that, but nevertheless, the call of the hour is some phenomenal leadership. Leaders put people first. Being able to create a vision, set the strategy, being able to create environments for people to thrive and deliver 
That is a number one expectation from a leader. Also, not just that they invest. Good leaders, and this is something that I do, is invest in people. Investment means, investment means certainly money, but it's more than just money. It is investing with your headspace. It's investing in what do people really want to accomplish? What is important to people? So investing in people, and then also very importantly, creating a culture. It's not just that if we don't create a behavior, behavioral norm, set of culture, set of approaches for decision-making, it doesn't stick. So culture to make everything that you do stick, those are crucial. So as a part of that, to circa 2017, I incubated an idea along with a few of my colleagues, industry colleagues, that there are only still to date 18% of Russell 3000, you pick your number, 18% of the top women, top tech leaders are women. 18%. Mm -hmm. So we decided we need to do something to help each other as well as create a pipeline for the next generation. So we formed T200. It started as a grassroots moment. It was just a WhatsApp chat group that we just got together and chatted. Then we scaled and we are now on a different platform. We have, uh, it's a registered formal 501c3. We have a fully functional board. We have about 500, 600 women. We launched Lyft, which is the next generation. So C-level minus one. And then also everybody else. So there's about 230 people at the top C level. And then there is another 300, 350 at the next level. And we give ourselves goals. So it, it is about helping each other. Our, our hashtag is hashtag better together. And we help each other. And um, women benefit from it in many ways. It's a safe space. Any question is fine. We help each other with talent and hiring and placing, transitions, board roles. And then lift our biggest goal is, and this is our simple theory, we all got together and helped each other is a good story, but also lifted the next generation of women. That's a great story. So we want to write the greater story. So that's why lift is crucial. And, and uh, one of our metrics of yardsticks of measurement of success is how many women have we lifted from the below the sea level to the sea level. That's a measure that we have. And we coach and mentor and guide them and network them, help them with with interviews and help them get to that level. And we, we, we gave ourselves a goal of three last year. We achieved the goal. And for this year, we're already past the three marks. So we are, that is a goal that we're all going to be working hard towards. If people were wanting to get involved, you know, what should they do? T200.org. So go to the website. It's a basic, simple website, T200.org. There's a form to submit. If, if you're a C-level, you can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn and I will personally nominate you because it's by invitation only. But if you're not a C-level, t200.org. And that sounds like a great mission. Uh, it sounds like you're doing great work. I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, you, you've got an interesting story. I, I'm curious to see, you know, where you go from here and, and all the cool things that you, uh, you know, build and do in the future. Um, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and, and, and telling us all about what's happening in the, you know, from the executive perspective, because I think, you know, that's the thing that we don't always, always hear, you know, like what, what leadership is, you know, trying to struggle with and, and the challenges that leadership's facing. So I appreciate you coming on and giving us a little insight into those things. Thank you. Chris. Thanks so much. Thank you. It was a great podcast. I enjoyed my conversation with you. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for watching. I'd love to hear from you in the comments and I would really appreciate it if you would click on that subscribe button. That helps the channel a ton. And I will see you in the next one.